Hello, hi everyone. Hope you've had a good start to Scottish Summit and thank you so much for tuning into the session on how to establish a power platform center of excellence here. And um, before we get started, a big, big thank you to all of our sponsors um, who've made this event happen. It's been such a fantastic event last year and really looking forward to continuing it um, in a virtual fashion this year. Um, so thank you to Script Runner, DQ uh, Global, Proximo3, Redspire, Agilis and Hitachi Solutions. Um, obviously this event wouldn't happen without you. My name is Manuela. I'm a program manager on the Parks and Automate Custom Advisor team here at Microsoft. Um, if you have any questions after the session, please feel free to reach out to me on, on Twitter. Um, when I'm, I'm not talking about the CUE and um, Center of Excellence, um, which is really, I guess, uh, you can find me talk, taking a stroll on a nearby beach with my um, little dog, Cherry, who you can um, see her in the picture and who I'm really fond of. Um, today, we will be talking about a few things, um, starting with the why, going into the what, and then um, the how, as we discuss some um, tooling approaches. This is kind of how we see um, sometimes the IT landscape before low code. Adoption processes are different. Um, there's a lot of silos. Each column is kind of holding up the organization, and that's a multi-year or decade um, effort. Um, organizations kind of form around those um, columns rather than providing evolving automation to the organization and its current needs. Sometimes these pillars are old. Um, organizations are scared to kind of make any changes to it. Um, they fear the unknown. They fear what might break. In the shadows between these pillars, other business applications grow in the cracks, and that has always been the case. Um, those are things like um, spreadsheets, access databases, SharePoint lists, um, basically anything that the users could get their hands on to make their lives easier. Um, there's been automation um, champions um, even before Power Apps and Power Automate were, were a thing in, in organizations, and, and many of you listening in today are, are those um, flowers that are um, coming through between the cracks. Um, sometimes these um, flowers would grow even beyond the expectation of the people or the team that created them. Um, they would become um, business critical, um, business important applications. And the goal of today's talk is to, to discuss a framework for the successful adoption, management and governance of the Power Platform so that these applications can thrive in a way that will ensure that the organization and each team can um, each team making them can be successful, secure, and adhere to agreed upon governance. Before we talk further about the, um, what makes up a center of excellence um, for the Power Platform, I really want to emphasize the why. The why is that this is our new reality. Um, there's a large shift to remote work. Um, organizations of all types face kind of difficult and hard choices today. Um, they're saving costs, reimagining operations, uh, redirecting productivity and trying to re-engage customers and work with the nuances of remote work and development. A Gartner study predicts that 48% of employees will work remotely even post the current pandemic as compared to 30% before. There's also evolving expectations of the workforce. As the world continues to rapidly embrace um, technology advancements, the next generation entering the workforce will demand digitized and advanced um, workplaces in line with their digital centric lives, where mobile applications and digitized services dominate everyday living. 35% um, of the workforce are currently digital native millennials who demand better digital experiences in their workplace as well. They don't want to be working with um, Excel spreadsheets and paper forms. They want everything to be an app, a simple streamlined, um, in, um, simple streamlined experience. They want the data that they need at the time that they need it at their hands. And there's also an economic downturn. Um, besides the shift to remote work and the changing workforce expectations, the state of economy around the world has only made things more complex and harder for businesses. Um, the need for digital transformation is heightened by the fact that, um, you know, 90% of business leaders agree that there is a need to enable process automation to flourish in the post pandemic world. But as organizations approach their digital transformation and power platform adoption, there's often many concerns and worries that are on their mind, um, such as how do I manage this? Um, is this shadow IT? Um, how do I manage it? Um, how do I maintain my legacy systems? 
Uh, how do I manage these business expectations and how do I bring all of those kind of paper processes and complex processes um, into the Power Platform with the, the right tools to create the right, um, right um, culture. In order to create a space where admins and makers can confidently and productively operate, we see that many organizations establish a center of excellence. Um, it's a coordinating function that ensures that the Power Platform strategy is aligned with the digital transformation strategy of the company. Establishing a CUE means nurturing organic growth while maintaining governance and control. A key principle is to clarify why you're setting up a CUE, what you aim to accomplish, and the key business outcomes that you hope to achieve. Then get started and learn and evolve along the way. For many, a CUE is the first step in uh, driving innovation and improvement. Um, it's a central function that can break down uh, geographic and organizational silos to bring together like-minded people with similar business goals, to share knowledge and success, to experiment and encourage each other, while at the same time providing standards, consistency, and governance to the organization. Establishing a center of excellence doesn't mean immediately standing up a whole new team. You can start small and evolve with your adoption. Um, we would recommend starting with um, establishing data loss prevention policies um, and establishing a process for managing um, licenses and access to data sources, as well as providing a, a wiki um, a documentation space to share those policies with your makers. Then evangelize by creating a community space where makers can connect with each other and learn from each other by starting to share internal success stories and by setting up a welcome email to welcome new makers. And then monitor your usage. Um, check who is creating apps, what are they connecting to, what business problems are they solving with those apps. Reach out to those makers and learn from them to evolve your CUE strategy with those learnings. Of course, adopting any new technology with such a broad applicability like the Power Platform is a transition for any organization. To help guide and manage this transition, we've just been working on an adoption maturity score, which is uh, which we've come up with in collaboration with some, some of our most successful customers. And we've identified consistent themes, patterns, practices, and behaviors that underpin the progress of successful organizations as they implement comprehensive digital transformation with the Power Platform. And we call this the Adoption Maturity Score, and it's a model that's broken down in five stages. Um, each stage describes um, the states of individual disciplines, such as strategy and vision, administration and governance, and nurture. Um, it's really important to keep in mind that this is not a, a checklist, nor do these stages need to progress at the same pace along all of these disciplines, but they can be used to sense check your progress um, and help inform where your focus is needed next in order to advance further. Um, so we've got the, the five stages. In the organic phase, the organization has pockets of success or experimentation with the Power Platform. Um, there's not really any visibility in organization-wide adoption and use. Um, sometimes the, the adoption is viral um, based on, to, um, on top of Excel and, and SharePoint as, as data sources, makers discovering Power Apps and Power Automate through the Office 365 offer, for example. But there's not really any overall strategy or, or a governance um, approach. Um, apps are largely kind of team-based supported by the makers, and the organization might see um, the potential of strategic investments, but there's not really a clear path forward on how to execute that. In the repeatable stage, um, organizations are taking what they've learned from the organic stage and are trying to put structure around the deployment of the Power Platform, um, often through controls that are implemented by a central IT team or other teams that are focused on the Power Platform. Um, the CUE Starter Kit, which we'll talk a little bit um, about later on, is deployed to provide a tenant-wide visibility into the use of the Power Platform and to begin to identify, if not control, applications that are beginning to become broadly used in the organizations. Um, these organizations sometimes think that the Power Platform is running out of control until they shape the use um, until they shape their use of the administrative and governance controls, um, transitioning into the defined stage. Um, so in the defined stage, organizations really standardize the repeatable practices that they've evolved in the previous phase. Um, they're achieving measurable success with the Power Platform, they're digital, digitally transforming the organization, and they've got a defined Power Platform Center of Excellence teams with defined roles and responsibilities. Uh, much of the transformation may still reflect the organic growth um, that got them to this point, but the CUE team is working to automate processes, define standard approaches, um, and that will move them to the scaled stage. 
Um, the scaled organization then has standard processes for managing and monitoring the power platform. Um, these processes are largely automated. They're well understood by makers. There's kind of a clear communication going on between the COE team and the makers. Um, everyone knows what they're responsible for. The Platform capabilities are used to transform the business broadly. They're used for um, enterprise critical applications and integrations. There's internal power platform champions that have established channels for sharing best practices, for training new makers, for conducting hackathons, etc. Um, there could also be kind of standard branded app templates and components available to makers to make sure that there's a consistent feel to, um, to the applications that are being built. And then the leading stage is where organizations have proven the capabilities of the power platform to really rapidly transform their, um, their organization, rapidly transform mission critical capabilities. There are standardized automated processes in place. There's an established community of experts that allows um, new digitization opportunities to be implemented very quickly. Um, the organization recognizes value quickly. They are beginning to integrate some of the more advanced capabilities, um, such as artificial intelligence. There's fusion teams that enable legacy capabilities and modern cloud architecture to be easily used within the power platform and that unblocks the broader use of existing data and automation. Um, so those fusion teams could be implementing um, custom connectors and APIs um, that makers can then use to build their um, apps and flows. Um, organizations in the leading stage are also influencers. Um, they, they influence the best practices in the community and drive new use of the power platform. So very often leading organizations are ones that, that are represented externally as well, ones that, that speak at conferences themselves, ones that we share on our blog posts. Um, the goal of this adoption maturity model is really to help organizations um, and their partners think through how they can improve their capabilities um, through how they can improve their existing capabilities or decide which capabilities matter most to them. Um, the decisions shouldn't just be based on the technology, but driven by the digital transformation strategy of the organization. So this is just an overview of how we think about the adoption maturity. We're looking to publish a very detailed um, table where we highlight um, specific tasks that fall under each um, stage and how you can progress um, your organization from one stage to the next. So um, keep an eye out, um, keep an eye out for that definitely. Um, many of you might have um, seen this slide before or heard this slide where, um, you know, we talk about low code being a, a team sport. And that is true, not just for the maker community, where there's often professional developers and citizen makers coming together to build an app. It's also true for the entire center of excellence, where there's many roles and responsibilities and people from different backgrounds working together to make the power platform adoption a success in the organization. Um, here's some of the roles and responsibilities that we typically see as organizations set up their um, center of excellence and as organizations succeed in their um, enterprise scale adoption and rollout of the power platform. There's a low code strategy team and that represents the key decision maker. Um, they, they ensure that the power platform strategy is aligned with um, organization goals. Um, they're responsible for adoption and change management and looking at new ways of working across the organization. There's the power platform admin team and they're responsible for establishing an environment strategy, setting up DLP policies, managing users, capacity and licensing. There's a power platform nurture team or enablement team, and they are, um, this can often consist of, of champions in your organization, and they would organize app in day events, um, hackathons. They would provide mentorship to makers to ensure that new makers get off to a really good start, and they would really look at evangelizing the platform through um, various events or adoption campaigns. There's also going to be a team or a function that, that looks after um, automating tasks, um, setting up automation through Azure DevOps, um, supporting architecture reviews, uh, creating and sharing common templates and reusable components um, or, or APIs. And then there's your user support team. So you will already have an established IT ticket support process. And it's really important to onboard those teams as well. Um, create guidance, FAQs, and figure out your support process and resources and how they will support your makers and apps that are being built with the Power Platform. 
Um, for all of these responsibilities, there's a, a set of personas that are typically involved. Your makers and champions, of course, um, typically also your professional developers that might contribute to the public from um, adoption by creating APIs or PCF components, for example. And then there's your IT department, um, enterprise and solution architects, information security, um, service management, application lifecycle management, um, your help desk, and then possibly existing uh, business change management teams. Um, typically and independent of how small or large your CU is, the key responsibi responsibilities fall into these three areas. Um, organize, where you look after your team, vision and strategy. Um, govern, um, some of the administrative and governance um, um, foundational policies. And activate, um, nurture uh, and support the makers. We'll now look at some of these, some of the responsibilities for these buckets. For um, strategy and vision, you really want to ensure that change initiatives are delivered consistently, that there is executive sponsorship and a dedicated power platform owner. Um, this really helps in bring, um, bringing the uh, power platform adoption to life. Um, this bucket is responsible for proving the value, um, educating across the organization and coming up with a strategy of how, who and what will be moved to the power platform. We often get asked about operating models, and here's some that we see, but keep in mind that each of these is just a, a mental model. Um, every organization has a very variation of multiple models along this continuum. For example, even if you opt for a centralized model where all the requirements are coming into a central delivery team, you will still have citizen makers discovering the platform and building apps for their teams. Um, so you will always have kind of elements of, of a matrix, for example. Um, but these models can really help you consider um, what your current software delivery model looks like and how you might want to lay the power platform um, over it or how your current model might evolve to accommodate the rapid development capability enabled by the power platform. Um, so in the centralized model, you would have a central team of product owners, um, citizen makers, professional developers, architects, um, change agents, project managers. And this central team looks after the development of applications based on organizational properties. Um, they will have foundational expertise in the power platform, and they might specialize in, in certain aspects of it, of it, such as AI builder or third party integrations. Um, in the decentralized model, you will have um, multiple teams across the organizations that are close to the day-to-day -day running of the various teams. Um, they will have resources to deliver apps consistently within organization guidelines. Um, each team runs autonomously and they can kind of grow and split in a cellular fashion. And you will have a centralized IT team that looks after the governance, um, so the security, organization policies and the support. Um, in the matrix model, you will have a centralized team of trained and certified specialists. You will have leaders of change, design, delivery, architecture, and specialized trainers to train local teams across the organization. And then local teams are made up of citizen makers that are plugged into the, central, into the, stru into the centralized structure to make sure that nothing gets lost in translation between the people doing their day-to-day -day jobs and using the apps and the people building the applications. Um, so this, this model really um, scales well and into the hundreds and thousands of, of people working on app creation. Uh, rapid app development can only happen at the speed that operations such as IT can support the apps that are being created. Um, so this is where BIS DevOps comes in, in, into its play. Um, it's a, it kind of represents the holistic relationship between app makers and operations, and it works in a virtuous loop. Um, for, this work, for this to work, all the teams need to have a clear vision of the digital culture the organization is moving towards. Um, for To get kind of the maximum value of the apps that are being created, they need reliable support, governance, and maintainability. Um, so as the technology evolves, those apps will want to get updated. They need to, be, they need to stay current. Um, having not only awareness of the change, but a plan for that is, is key to successful apps. Um, typically, we see BIS DevOps being successful in organizations that already already have a very agile um, mindset. Let's now look at the Govern bucket. Um, so the administration and governance bucket ensures that digital guardrails are in place so that makers can confidently create. It means managing environments, managing the capacity, managing licenses, um, securing the platform, and then monitoring resources and usage and setting up alerts to act on specific behavior. So we 
over the next um, over the next few minutes, we'll talk about some of the best practices, especially when it comes to setting up an environment strategy and setting up DLP policies. The starting point of establishing an environment strategy, but also um, any other administrative activity is to assign your admins the Power Platform Service Admin role. Um, this grants access to um, fully manage Power Apps, Power Automate and, and Power BI. And this sh role should be granted to admins that don't need global tenant admin access and they're dedicated to managing the Power Platform products. You then want to restrict the creation of net new production environments to admins. Um, limiting the environment creation is beneficial to maintain control in general, both to prevent unaccounted capacity consumption and to reduce the number of environments that you need to manage. Um, if users have to request environments from a central team, it's easier to see what people are working on um, and admins act as the gatekeepers. Treat the default environment as a team and employee productivity environment for your business groups. Um, you can rename the environment in the admin center to make the purpose of that environment self-explanatory. Clearly communicate to your makers that the default is not to be used for production scenarios, but for personal apps that aren't meant to be used by the many. And then establish a process for requesting access um, to or the creation of new environments. Um, so with the environment creation itself locked down and default reserved for very specific personal apps, make it clear to the makers in your organization that a proper development project should be started by requesting a new dedicated environment where there's clear communication of intent and support between the developers and the admins. Set up dev test and production environments for specific business groups or applications. Um, having those stage environments obviously ensures that changes that are made in the development environment do not break end users in production. Um, this is especially important for mission critical and business important um, applications or where business units need a, a dedicated space most. And sometimes this can also be influenced by the connectors that a business unit needs for their um, uh, for their application development, where you might need a dedicated environment with a very dedicated DLP policy. And then uh, you can use individual use environments for proof of concepts or, or trainings. We typically recommend a tiered approach to productivity environments. Um, so, like, so like we've mentioned earlier, the default environment has a very specific purpose. It's quite a unique environment in that everyone is a maker in that environment and you can't currently um, block that uh, role assignment. This is also the environment that is used for first party integrations, like creating an app or a flow from a SharePoint list. To reduce the risk to data, the type of connectors used in your apps and flows should be limited to a very restrictive set of DLP policies. Um, this policy should cover common individual and small team productivity use cases like working with SharePoint data, sending emails or having an approval workflow. While the default environment co often covers many use cases, there are going to be power users that will have more advanced needs for their applications and flows, um, like integrating with Microsoft Teams, Azure Active Directory or Azure DevOps. For this purpose, we recommend creating a power user environment. Um, this is a shared environment that should have a less risk averse DLP policy in place, but admins are managing the environment maker list um, for this environment. You, you would review the available connectors in this environment to make sure it's the right fit for the, for the makers in that environment. You would document the purpose um, of and the available connectors on a, on a SharePoint site or a wiki that, that your um, makers can, can look at and you would create an automated process for makers to request access to this environment um, using either Microsoft Forms or, or an app, um, including an approval process. Um, the Power Dev environment is, a, is similar to the Power User environment, a, a shared environment intended to be used by experienced developers uh, to build more complex apps and flows. More powerful connectors like SQL, Azure Blob Storage or Azure Functions are available in um, for that environment and similar to the power user environment you would manage the dlp policy and the maker list um, quite closely um, for both of these sometimes it's also uh, um, it can be a good idea to kind of require the users that get access to this environment to complete some um, training to make them aware of your internal policies before they get they get access to that environment. And then you will have training environments. So those are shared environments for internal training events. Um, the DLP policy matches the, the training scenarios. And 
sometimes a trial environment is a really good fit for that it expires after 30 days or if you're using a production environment um, make sure that you clean it up after each training so that it kind of is reset for um, for the next training in addition to trial plans, there's also the free PowerApps community plan. Um, this is a special plan that allows individuals to um, self-serve sign up and provides an individual environment that a user can use to build apps and flows. Um, but these environments are for individual use, um, so there's no ability to share from this environment into any other environment. Um, so it's not recommended to use this type for kind of enterprise development purposes, but it is a great environment for users to experiment with Power Apps and learn, um, complete their learning and training. Um, if you're looking at the admin center, those environments will um, show up in the list under, um, as the type developer. Um, the shared environments will cover um, quite, quite a few use cases for um, team and personal productivity scenarios, but some projects or, or specific teams will benefit from having custom environments to support their um, business unit specific use cases or ALM scenarios. Um, so you will work with project teams and business units to um, establish if they require a dedicated development test and production environment, or if they could share a, a test and production environment with, um, with, other, um, with other projects, for example, and they only need a, a dedicated development environment. Um, so use case could be that you've got a managed HR production environment where all of your HR production um, applications are are hosted and you've got a shared HR test environment where all um, HR um, applications are um, for testing. There's a dedicated group of test users that already have access to this. Um, so if you're working on a project that is building a new HR app, you might want a dedicated um, development environment, but you will deploy it to the dedicated um, already existing um, shared test and production environment. It's really important to clearly communicate the purpose of the default, the shared environment to your uh, makers, um, the purpose of the trial and developer environments, the process of requesting custom environments, as well as the responsibilities of a maker in, in that they need to keep the tenant clean, um, so delete environments, apps and flows that are no longer needed, the, um, for them to share wisely, so don't overshare apps and flows, um, watch out for kind of oversharing there, and to protect organization data. Um, as you know, DLP policies enable admins to isolate business data from non-business data um, using the classification, connector classification, and it all, DLP policies also allow admins to block connectors um, completely. So let's now look at what a sample um, DLP strategy could look like for a fictional organization um, called, called Contoso. Overall, we would recommend using um, tenant level policies um, with a restrictive policies on shared environments like the default environment and create the minimal number of policies per environment. Um, there is no strict hierarchy between, um, between policies. So if you have um, multiple policies applied Applying to the same environment, it will always be the most restrictive um, set of connectors that will be able to be used together. So Contoso follows the environment strategy that we've discussed in the past few minutes. Um, they've got a default environment. Um, the DLP policy that is mapped to the default environment is a tenant policy that applies to all environments except selected ones. It's the most restrictive DLP policy and it, the connectors in this, um, in this set are limited to um, Office 365 and other standard uh, microservices. Everything else is blocked there. Um, then can also have a shared environment, a power user environment. Um, the DLP policy applied to this environment is less, res re less restrictive and it, it applies to include environments. So it's a tenant policy and specific environments are included in that policy. Um, here, there are some Azure services, including um, in addition to the Office 365 services that are available there. Um, since this is a non-default environment, admins control the environment maker list for this. Um, in addition, there are some um, business units who are creating line of business applications and they have dedicated dev test and production environments for their tax and audit um, subsidiaries across various countries. The environment maker access to these environments is again carefully managed um, and there's appropriate um, first and third party connectors that are available using um, tenant policy. So there's the Contoso um, Tex DLP policy. It includes all of the Tex environments and the connectors there are specific to the use cases of, that, um, of those environments of the makers um, there. So they could include things like um, SAP, for example, and the same is true for the um, audit business units. 
Um, in a very similar way, um, IT have dev test and production environments for, um, for their um, use cases, for their scenarios. And there's also a tenant policy in place where um, the IT environments are included. And this is a kind of a dedicated, um, dedicated scenario there. And then Contoso is a special purpose environment that is dedicated to their center of excellence activities. Um, in Contoso, the DLP policy for this special purpose environment will be very high touch because uh, the nature of the team is very experimental. And the Contoso admins trust the CUE team um, with that environment. So the DLP policy is actually delegated to the environment admin of the team. This environment is excluded from all other DLP policies and is only managed by the environment policy where the CUE team decides the, the connectors that are um, available there. Um, this is, of course, an exception rather than the rule at Contoso. Um, as expected, any new environments will be mapping to the most restrictive DLP policy, the all environments um, policy there. And you can then work on excluding that from that, um, from that policy. With the Power Platform, you've got the out-of-the-box um, capabilities that are part of the Power Platform Admin Center, but you also have management connectors and PowerShell commandlets that give you full visibility into um, everything that is going on in, in your environments, in your tenant, and this and provides you with um, re access to those resources. Um, so those connectors and partial commandlets um, allow you to build the policies that you need to implement administration um, and governance uh, requirements for your organization. One example that is using the uh, management connectors to build um, very custom um, governance and administration capabilities is called the CUE Starter Kit. It's a templatized implementation of, of best practices. It's maintained by my team, and it represents what we've learned from some of our lar largest organizations that are implementing the Power Platform. Um, it really isn't a checkbox exercise. It's a, a tool that's built on top of the Power Platform that's intended to be just that, a starter kit for the technology to enable your processes. It can help you with the how once you've established the what and the why. Um, some of the data and the foundation that you likely need is in there, but your organization undoubtedly will want to tailor this for its own use. Um, as you do, we would love to learn from you and incorporate your innovations back into the tool. Um, so I'll be showing you the CUE Starter Kit um, throughout the presentation today as well. The CUE Starter Kit is shipped in, in various components that layer on top of each other. We call them kind of the building blocks. Um, and the purpose of that is so you can pick and choose what is right for you, but they also represent kind of the maturity journey that we see organizations go through. Uh, so the initial um, solution, the initial component is called Admin or Core. Um, this allows you to gain enterprise-wide insights into your adoption. It really maps to that organic stage, um, organic and, and repeatable stage of the adoption maturity, um, here you will get insights to drive your, your strategy. Uh, then there's the governance components. And um, with those components, you can then start to perform risk assessments, identify orphaned, complex, or unused resources, and you can drive discipline through the right communication. It's typically, once you're very through the admin components, you gain visibility into what is going on. And in governance, you will then decide what to do with that knowledge. And then there's the nurture components um, through which you can then share best practices, onboard new makers, and create kind of further excitement around the Power Platform adoption. We then have um, add-ons, and they, those can be used independent of the rest of the series starter kit. So all of the, the solutions on this screen are, uh, you can use standalone. Um, so there's the innovation backlog um, through which you can submit ideas for apps and flows that need to be built uh, and describe pain points and, and measures. Uh, this one is the first solution that's available for Dataverse for Teams. Um, so it is available through a seeded license and can be used with a seeded license there. And then we have the ALM accelerator and theming components to help with um, both ALM processes as well as enterprise branded theming. Kind of very briefly, the way the series starter kit works is that you've got apps, flows, connectors, audit log information in your tenant. We have sync flows that run on a um, daily or weekly basis, and they crawl your tenant for a metadata around um, those resources and write that information to tables in the CUE environment in the Dataverse instance. And then the dashboard and all of the apps are built on top of those tables. Let's look at a demo of the Power BI dashboard. 
in many ways, the Power BI dashboard that's part of the CV Star Deck, it is kind of the heart of the kit. Um, it provides you with a tenant-wide holistic overview of what is going on in your tenant. It enables you to perform risk assessments based on viral sharing. It allows you to identify orphaned or unused resources, and it allows you to find your star app and flow makers, um, see what connectors they're using and how they're adopting the Power Platform. Next to that, it also allows you to explore um, some of the data points that are available in the kit. So if you're looking to build your own governance um, approach on top of that, the dashboard is a really good way to start identifying some of those um, some of those data points that we have. So let's look a little bit at the structure of the Power BI dashboard. It, it contains quite a lot of pages. So we've, um, we've added this introduction page and again the breakdown in in the power bi dashboard is similar to the um, the building blocks of the cv starter kit in general so we've got the monitor and admin section where it's really about querying the inventory um, allowing you to filter and drill down into the usage of your tenant and getting familiar with how your makers are adopting the platform then we've got the govern section um, this is where some of the data points that you've identified are then used to create archive scores to create um, complexity scores to identify kind of virus sharing etc and then the nurture components to really drill down into the usage and adoption of your of the power platform in your organization um, so the overview pages basically just give you an overview of um, specific numbers like number of environments number of app makers number of flow makers um, where those makers are based and how many apps and uh, flows some of those uh, makers are are creating um, so basic kind of tenant tenant level inventory there um, you can then for each of the resources you can then drill um, deeper so for example for the environment the the deep dive lets you know how many teams environments how many developers so community plan environments you have how many custom connectors do you have across your um, environments and how many dataverse instances there are you can also see the number of apps and flows per environment. So from here, you can, for example, identify unused um, app, uh, unused environments that, that might be able to get deleted and free up some capacity there. And you can see the makers that have created the most um, environments if, for example, environment creation is not locked down in your, in your tenant. From the apps page, you can see, again, the total number of apps in your tenant, how many were created this month, how many makers you have, the breakdown between Canvas and model-driven applications. And we do have a measure to identify production apps so those are apps that are used uh, launched more than 50 times a month or have more than five unique users uh, per month uh, so that you can identify those um, from here as well you can see the creation trend so this is a good indicator if for example you're running internal hackathons or internal training events to monitor if the app creation is um, in increasing after um, those events and you get a list of all those applications and you can filter them down by the different types. So you could look at all of your um, SharePoint um, custom apps, for example, or you could look at apps that are using the common data service the common data service um, connector there, for example, as well. And similar views are available for, um, for cloud flows, desktop flows, and virtual agents. If we then drill a little bit deeper into some of the govern functionality, you might want to see which um, apps are using um, premium capabilities. So each connectors have a, have a tier, so standard, custom, or, or premium tier. And on this page, for example, you can filter by connector tier. So you've got your premium connectors here, and it shows you exactly the premium Premium connectors, so um, common data service dataverse, um, SQL, HTTP are some of the premium connectors that are being used in apps. You get a list of applications that are using those premium connectors and makers that have built those applications. So you can really identify where the premium usage in your um, in your environments is, is coming from there. And the other thing I wanted to highlight is a relatively new the Power Apps adoption page here, and that allows you to identify um, trends over time. So you can see your monthly active users over time, your user base over time, makers over time, and premium MAU over time. So you can identify if your usage is um, is growing, if your adoption campaigns are successful. Um, obviously, in my demo tenant, this is quite erratic. Um, hopefully, in your tenant, this will be um, a nice, uh, nice growth there. Whilst we won't have time to go into detail about all of the um, individual components of the CV starter kit, there's two new additions that I want to call out. 
One is the DLP editor. Um, this allows you to review if existing policies impact flows or apps in your tenant. Um, so if you have a, a DLP policy set up on your tenant, you can, th with this application, review if there's any um, impact on existing applications. And you can also use it to create new policies and see what apps or flows would be impacted before you save the change. Um, and then environment management for teams so that many organizations will want to make sure that the database for teams capacity is allocated to the most valuable use cases. So we've created a kind of an approval flow where after the environment is created, the owner is asked for a business justification for newly created database for teams environments. And there's an automatic cleanup um, happening of those environments where the business justification hasn't been provided or, or has been rejected. Um, so that kind of helps with um, some of that management there. Let's now look at the nurture bucket or activate bucket. And this is really where you would look at um, the pillars of community evangelism and training. You would look at identifying champions, organizing um, internal um, training events, I internal hackathons, and really creating a thriving community that can help you prove the value of the power platform adoption. You will organize some show and tell sessions um, and come up with a, even a career strategy for your makers. Real success happens when um, the when IT and the makers work well together, work closely together, where IT um, sets up secure foundations, makers build the first app, and as they do, they will, will receive an automated welcome email that's pointing them towards the right resources to be successful. Um, IT monitors apps and the usage. Um, the usage and they um, are able to communicate um, to, ma to makers automatically to send notifications and alerts to ask makers for further information um, like, um, like a mitigation plan, like business justification for their usage. Uh, makers use company templates like branded templates and, and components. They're um, engaging with the community, uh, learning from other makers. They're able to attend internal training events and, and hackathons. Um, the IT department set up um, app catalogs and temp template catalogs for um, ease of discovery, for increased adoption. And when makers have ideas for enterprise applications, they're able to um, submit requests for dedicated environments for the connectors that they need that uh, the IT department aut um, automatically is able to kind of approve and, and, and stand up. And um, all of that kind of goes, goes hand in hand there. Creating an internal champions community can really help you um, in being successful with the Power Platform adoption. You want to design and align your champions community to organizational objectives and the vision for the Power Platform in your organization. You want to attain sponsorship from key stakeholders and executives to enable champions to commit time and effort to that. You want to focus on the people. How can you help them? How can you unblock challenges and how can you celebrate them? Um, typically, what works well is creating a Yamora Teams community for champions to share um, updates, successes, connect with each other. You want to provide materials to support their work, um, for example, access to training materials, access to templates, and you want to learn from them um, so they can really provide you with um, feedback on works, what works well and what doesn't work well. They can create a circle of influence um, between amongst their teams and departments um, so they can really um, ensure that the, pop, the word of the public firm gets out there. And of course, they're the ones that are closest to the business um, problems, so they can identify business challenges and possible solutions. And through them, you can um, continue to um, increase your public firm adoption. Very often in mature organizations, the problem isn't finding people who are willing to make apps. It is making sure that the most valuable scenarios are picked for development. Um, so we've created the Innovation Backlog, which is part of the CUE Starter Kit. It's an app that allows you to submit ideas for apps and flows that need building. Um, as you do that, you describe pain points and how to measure them. And this generates the um, ROI and the complexity score. And the Power Platform CUE team or development team can use that to pick the most impactful ideas for making. The other side of the coin is that as a maker, I can go in and I, claim, I can claim a solution for development and then gather kind of feedback and build a portfolio of apps that I have made and that can help with the career, that can help with my career progression.
Another thing that's really successful in, in helping with internal adoption is creating an internal app catalog um, to make apps more discoverable. Um, so as a COE admin, you would audit and validate apps that are graduated to show up in the app catalog. And as end users, I can browse the apps that are available there. I can maybe request access or I can find out about more about them by connecting with the maker. Um, this can really help in avoiding duplication of, um, of application scenarios as well, and especially kind of enterprise-wide applications um, such as HR apps or specific campaigns um, can be made easily discoverable through this um, entry point. If you want to create more excitement in your organization and inspire more people to join your PowerApps community, um, there's a few ways of, of, of achieving that, such as an app showcase. Um, that's a great way to do that. Um, teams meet to kind of demo what they have built, problems they've solved, show the impact that they've created with the apps that they've made. It really is an opportunity for other teams and makers to see the impact of digital culture and the business value that they could bring by joining the Power Platform community. Um, you could make that part of existing company events, such as town hall meetings or generic um, tech showcases um, to ensure that there's a wide variety of people attending and, and seeing your apps. And you want to encourage a variety of different makers and problems to be showcased. Um, don't show five form over paper um, apps, but focus on different use cases and ensure that there's makers from different backgrounds attending to emphasize that the Power Platform is for everyone. You could also celebrate your makers and champions by sharing the success story and focus on the business value and impact that they have had on the organization. Did the solution save time, money, or paper? Um, did it increase employee or customer satisfaction? Uh, you can include metrics to share um, how successful um, their, their adoption was. And you want to focus not just on the solution and the technical aspects, but also on the maker. What's their background? How did they learn about the Power Platform? What was their upskilling journey like? Um, you can look at some of our public case studies that are on our blog for inspiration on how to format your internal success stories. And to close this session, let me leave you with a little bit of homework, because now it's your turn. You want to enable digital transformation by establishing a center of excellence and empowering people closest to the business problem to solve it. You want to think about enabling a portfolio rather than just one application or one solution to maximize the business value. Think big and be open to evolving the architecture based on the business problems. Invest in capturing success stories of your people, your champions, and your apps, your use cases. And don't start from scratch. Explore the CUE starter kit to see how tooling can help you. And don't stop at the first hurdle. Learn and evolve along the way and share your lessons with us. Many of the lessons that we've um, just talked about in the past 45 minutes are available under AKMS Power Platform Guidance, where um, as the Environment Strategy, DLP Strategy, some of the how to organize hackathons, how to organize training events, etc., are all written down for you to learn, learn from. Thanks for attending. I hope this um, session was useful to you.